Uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, all right. So over the past year, I've been learning about prairie oak ecosystems in the South Puget Lowlands. Specifically, I've been evaluating the effects of mycorrhizal inoculation and plant community impacts on the survivorship and growth of Gary Oak seedlings on joint base Lewis McCord. But before we go too deep, I'd like to make a case for why we should care about saving prairie oak ecosystems and Gary Oaks in the first place. Prairie oak ecosystems exist primarily in the Willamette Valley Puget Trough Georgia Basin, aka the WPG, ecoregion, and are one of the most endangered ecosystems in North America. In the South Puget Lowlands specifically, native prairie cover has declined by approximately 97%, and the loss of prairie habitat exceeds 90%. The reasons for these declines are multifaceted, but include fire suppression due to settler colonialism, habitat fragmentation, conifer encroachment, development, non-native species invasions, and native species decline. And I wanted to include this quote uh, from the Prairie Oaks and People. It's from the forward of this business action plan developed by multiple organizations in the region, and I think it sums things up pretty well. The Prairie Oak ecosystems need help. In some places, it is on life support. Species are gone or barely hanging on, and in others, the native habitat has been so overwhelmed by invasive species as to become unrecognizable. Rescue is now dependent on us to step up with the necessary resources to start rebuilding the relationship. However, in some places with immediate intervention and regular nurturing, the human connections to prairies and oaks can be reestablished, not only to save this imperiled ecosystem and its species, but to rekindle a lost heritage. And then I also included this graphic from the same document, um, and it kind of sums up some of the losses that we're experiencing and will continue to experience due to the loss in habitat. So we've got 41 species listed as threatened or endangered, the federal, state, or provincial levels. 13 threatened or endangered species have been extirpated or near extirpated from Canada. 50 other species are vulnerable and at risk of continued declines to levels qualifying for listing as threatened or endangered. And 23 species have been near extirpated or extirpated from at least one ecoregion in their range. And then I included these images um, just to show some of the enigmatic species that occupy prairie oak ecosystems. So on the top left, we have the streaked horned lark, uh, the dusky winged butterfly, which the Gary Oak is its only larval species, host species, the Mazama pocket gopher, the Taylor checkered spot butterfly, western gray squirrel, and the golden paintbrush. Um, so I, for a minute, I just want to talk about some of the importance of Gary Oaks. Um, First, the ecological importance is oak acorns are an essential food source for numerous mammals, like some of the ones I listed earlier. Oak, oaks act as homes for birds, reptiles, mammals, amphibians, and plants. Oaks can shade out invasive species if allowed to establish, which can, which can help those open prairie areas persist. And often species richness is higher in areas dominated by oaks and adjacent conifer forests. Gary oaks also hold a lot of cultural importance, um, especially for indigenous folks. Um, I'm not going to read this whole entire quote, but it's by a man named David Harrelson, who's a tribal historic preservation officer for the Confederate tribes of the Grand Ronde, which is a group of about 30 tribes in Oregon. And I just want to highlight the last part of the quote, which talks about uh, oaks, oak acorns as a food source. So he says, uh, one generation produces enough food for a person, 25 years, 50 years enough for three people, 75 years and a whole family of people can live off of food. Um, also, oak acorns were soaked to remove the bitter tannins, and the bark of the Gary Oak was used as part of a four barks medicine to treat tuberculosis and other ailments. Um, so why should we plant oaks other than those great reasons I just gave? Uh, oak recruitment in the Pacific Northwest has decreased dramatically and regeneration is historically low. Um, and successful reintroductions can increase eco ecosystem resilience. But Gary Oaks require a combination of pre and post treatments to establish long term. And then I included this video. Uh, it's, it was made by the Center for Natural Lands Management, and it, it sums up a lot of things I'm talking about and includes the importance of fire as an ecological management tool. Uh, so if, if you get time, you should watch it later. I'm not going to play it right now. Uh, moving on to my research questions. Uh, first, does mycorrhizal inoculation have a statistically significant effect on survivorship and growth? Does artificial inoculation benefit the oak seedlings, even if the specific species used are not known to have a direct association with oaks? Does site quality have a measurable effect on seedling growth and survivorship? But before we can try to answer these questions, we need to learn a little bit more about what mycorrhizae are and how mycorrhizal inoculation works. So what are mycorrhizae? 
Well, uh, the word mycorrhiza originates from two Greek words. The first one is myco, meaning fungus, and rhiza, meaning root. So these fungus roots are uh, part of a larger uh, population of microorganisms that occupy almost all ecosystems within the rhizosphere and are the primary force responsible for nutrient uptake by terrestrial plants. Um, they're also uh, it's been hypothesized that some of the earliest land plants approximately 450 million years ago, uh, before these plants developed roots of their own, they were colonized by hyphal fungi. Um, and also they exist on a spectrum from mutualistic to parasitic. So whereas common knowledge has thought that uh, mycorrhizae only benefit their host organism, as we've developed these new methodologies, uh, we're able to kind of tease out some of the nuances within this and have found that mycorrhizae can actually uh, parasitize their host. So there are seven different types of mycorrhizal inoculation, mycorrhizae, but for the purpose of this study, I'm just going to be focusing on two. The first one is our buscular mycorrhizae fungi, or AMF, and ectomycorrhizae, or EMF. Uh, AMF is a generalist. Uh, it associates with approximately 80% of all vascular plants, um, and it's unique in its functionality and its structure in that it has these infraradical uh, hyphae, which penetrate between the cortical cells of the root and form what's called arbuscules. And these help in the bidirectional transference of nutrients and water to the host and back to the fungi. On the left, we have EMF, uh, and those are different from AMF. They associate with a 2 to 3% of all plant species, mostly woody shrubs and trees. Um, and they don't actually penetrate between the cells of the root, uh, but they form what's called a harding net and a sheath around the outside of the root. Um, they're unique and they can produce up to seven times more hyphae than AMF, um, which makes them really good at extending into the soils and providing access to more nutrients and water that the plant wouldn't normally be able to get. So some of the benefits, like I said, increased water acquisition, which in turn leads to drought tolerance. Uh, nitrogen acquisition, uh, AMF can deliver up to 80% of phosphorus and 25% of the nutrient uh, nitrogen needs of the host plant. And they've been found to increase resistance to root and foliar pathogens. So pretty cool organisms. Um, some of the drawbacks of this relationship, the symbiosis, is because AMF are generalists in their association, they can all also uh, associate with weedy or invasive species, in turn altering the plant community composition and even facilitating um, the reproduction of invasive species. Also, the cost of EMF and AMF symbiosis can be too taxing on the host. Like I said, it can be a parasitic relationship. Um, and then commercial inocula used in restoration settings often reflects um, early successional and weedy inocula, which may in turn hinder restoration goals. So uh, my study, this study is based off of uh, JBLM's Fish and Wildlife um, and their efforts to, because they contain some of the uh, largest uh, prairie oak ecosystems remaining in the South Puget Lowlands, they've been putting a lot of effort into restoring and maintaining these open areas and in turn planting oaks. So my study is based on um, a planting that already occurred and on the oak planting report which outlines a concerted effort to restore our South Beach Sound Prairies. Um, so uh, acorns were sown at the Sustainability of Prisons nurture, uh, Nursery in 2018. Uh, 500 of them were inoculated and 500 uninoculated. And then these thousand Gary Oaks were planted in six different sites uh, with protective growth tubes and mulch rings um, in different areas in JBLM. So I was able to go out with teams of interns and collect above, above ground growth data, uh, height data, trunk diameter data, survival status, and inoculation status. And I was uh, visualized this data in this interactive map that I created. Um, so you can see if I click on one of these icons, it will show me the planting site, the number of oaks, the survival rate. And we can zoom in and we can see the individual seedlings because I was able to geolocate them um, using the collector app and with the help of those interns like I previously mentioned. And you can see it's kind of visualized in some interesting trends. Um, and then I also created uh, this 3D map, which visualizes, uh, I think this map and the layer I used does a good job of showing the effort to recreate these ecotones between the open prairies and the dense conifer forests. Um, and you can see here, it's a 3D model. Um, yeah. 
Uh, here are the six planting sites, pictures of each site from left to right is plant, planting site one, on the right is planting site six. Uh, in order to add another variable to analyze um, potential associations between inoculation and survivorship and growth, um, I used, with the help of Adam Martin, used a floristic quality assessment or an FQA to provide a quantitative measure to ascertain site quality. I also used a subset of data, um, 60 seedlings, half inoculated, half not, to see if any associations arose with distance to the nearest established oak and survivorship and growth rates. So going into our results, overall survivorship was very high. Um, the un uh, inoculated seedlings had a survival rate of 92.5%, 85.52% uh, for uninoculated seedlings. So overall pretty high. Uh, on all these figures, the x-axis represents the planting site. Um, so you can see here, overall very high survivorship with the exception of planting site three, the inoculated seedlings all had higher rates of survival than the uninoculated ones. Uh, and then looking at height, um, this is where some interesting trends emerge. So the above ground growth, which in this case is height, had a higher average among the uninoculated seedlings than the inoculated seedlings. And you can see that reflected in the color bars. So orange is uninoculated, blue is inoculated. And then the same was the case for trunk diameter. So I thought this was very interesting. Um, here's a chart of the floristic quality index. Um, and you can see it does vary quite a bit with the highest quality sites being site two and site three. So after running some statistical tests in R with the help of Sarah, um, I, I, we didn't find uh, any of the results to be statistically significant and the distributions were, didn't meet the assumption of, assumptions of normality. So in order to account for this, I used um, a gener generalized linear model and a linear model to um, ascertain what the probabilities are and how likely um, my data represents a normal distribution given an arbitrary number of trials. We can see here, um, pretty similar to the raw, raw data I showed earlier, um, but with high uh, error bars here, and those represent the upper and lower quantiles. <clears throat> um, and then I have it broken down by site. You can see still a lot of statistical uncertainty in these results. One really interesting trend, and it provided the only statistically significant result for my data, was measuring survivorship and FQI. So as you can see here, as the floristic quality index increases, the survivorship increases. And that provided a p-value of 0.02. So what does all of this mean? So uh, these results indicate a high level of uncertainty in the data. Uh, and this is probably because I only have one growth season, um, one data set, and because there are some variables that I was not able to analyze, like the below ground growth. Um, but it also shows that site quality is a vital, vital factor in outplantings and in restoration settings. Um, as I mentioned earlier, above ground growth was higher for the uninoculated seedlings, which could be a result of a couple of things. It could be um, Gary Oaks in the first few years of growth um, tend to focus most of their energy on developing the root system. So one potential reality is that the commercial inoculum used could, could be just assisting in that development of the root systems. Um, and that's why we see the repressed above ground growth rates. Or the commercial inoculum could be uh, actually hurting the seedlings because uh, it is a wide range of different species used and they could be benefiting invasive species in, in the area or parasitizing the host. So in conclusion, um, this study provides a baseline for longitudinal studies. So like I said, we have data from one growth season, but someone five years, 10 years down the road could take my data, replicate my study, and be able to hopefully tease out some of these variable associations with greater statistical significance and see if any trends can emerge. Um, also, the effects of mycorrhizal inoculation, it's only been in the last few years that uh, we've developed the methodologies to be able to ascertain the species specific responses in the soil uh, and with the host plant. So there's a lot of unknowns here. Um, all in all, more research is needed. I'm sure that's a common theme, but uh, more studies that focus on these species specific interactions with hosts and what's going on below the ground are very important.
for the continued restoration and growth of Gary Oaks. So thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge everybody who helped me in this process, Sarah Hammond, Adam Martin. Uh, I want to acknowledge Sustainability and Prisons Project as well for all the hard work that they do and allowing me to do this study in the first place. So thank you very much.